Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. And this is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. I think I scared Beth when I said, hey. You did. Good morning. <laughs> morning again. <laughs> Can't come at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> Not ready for it. <laughs> well, I'm ready. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm, it's so warm here. Summer is happening. It's really warm. Yeah. We hope everybody I, yeah. had a good Mother's Day. I know. Yes. Because when this drops, it'll be the day after. So yeah. I hope you all did. Happy Mother's I hope, Day. I hope we had a good Mother's Day too. I know. <laughs> I mean, I I'm kind of celebrating with a mimosa already. So I'm just pretending that it's Mother's Day right now. <laughs> she pretends this every day. P.S. Um, <laughs> don't we all? Don't we all? The I always do those little dates with my kids. Oh, um, that's Mother's right. Day, the week of Mother's Day, I take each one of my kids for their, they pick something to take mommy on a date. So we've been in, we've been in talks of what we're going to yeah. do. So I'll have to let you guys know. Yeah. That's so fun. I like that. Yeah. It's a cute idea. It makes me happy. Yeah. I should steal it actually. Cause I have, I don't do it. a whole lot of one on one time these days lately. So no, it's impossible right now. It's too much going on yes. in the day. So, um, but anyway, yeah. So uh, I have to tell you a story, though, even though you know this story already. Mm -hmm. But you told me a story recently that reminded me of this, and we weren't doing podcasting at the time. So I didn't get to tell all of our listeners this hilarious thing that I did two okay. years ago. <laughs> okay. So back when, moved, back in back in the olden days. That's what my kids olden say. Days. Anything that happened before COVID, they're like, back in the olden days. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. The, the good golden years of 2019. Normal times, <laughs> yes. olden days. <laughs> so back in those olden days, uh, when we first moved here to St. Louis, um, Emery, my husband, had gone through all of his clothes to just kind of like, you know, you're, you're putting your stuff in the closet. So you're like, oh, I can go through everything and see what do I not want to keep? What do I not need anymore? So this is what he's doing. So he makes two piles. And he's got one in our bedroom and one in the guest bedroom. And we're also at this this time getting a closet, our closet redone, so, you mm -hmm. know, putting in shelving and stuff like that. So he tells me one day, hey, can you bring my clothes or the clothes um, to Goodwill? It's in a pile next to the bed. Just bring them over to Goodwill. That's what I'm getting rid of. And I'm like, sure, great, awesome. So I do it that day. He comes home from work that night and he comes down and he's like, hey, um, what happened to the pile of clothes that, you know, next to our bed? And I go, I brought it to Goodwill, like you asked me to. And he was like, oh, um, well, I meant the pile of clothes next to the guest bed <gasps> because <laughs> the pile of clothes next to our bed were all of my keepers. So <laughs> it, when I tell you every pair of pants he owned except for suit pants, <laughs> All his joggers, all of his jeans, all of his shorts, like everything, like hundreds and hundreds of dollars <laughs> worth of pants that he now does not have <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I remember when this happened and you seriously were like, well, we were going to go out to dinner tonight, but we can't because Emery doesn't have any pants. <laughs> And I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I feel like there's a story there. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't get comfortable after work, like he, unless he just wore his underwear around. Like, I mean, <laughs> legitimately, I gave away all of his clothes. And for weeks, I went back, like on whatever, you know, in the morning to see when they were going to pull stuff out. And he, there's a crew that go to this Goodwill. And I, and I met them because I saw them every morning at the same time because they knew when they brought out the new stuff and because they wanted to search the racks that they're like secondhand store owners. And so they grab all the good stuff so that because they know, well, this is on sale here for $1, but I'm going to be able to get like 20, 25 bucks for this. Oh, yeah. Especially store. if it's like Nike joggers and things like that that are in, which I know that's what they were, right? 100% of what he owns. <laughs> right. So if, if I don't get to these first, these vultures are going to get to <laughs> I recovered two pairs of pants and they were like the two that were like his least favorites. <laughs> of, of course they were. <laughs> so if y'all think you've made mistakes in life, just know that I once gave away all 
of my husband's pants <laughs> just in one day. In one day. Mission failure. Five minutes, actually. It wasn't even a day. Five minutes. <laughs> Here you go. Take them all. <laughs> <laughs> Also, if I ever open up a clothing store, I'm totally going to be one of those Goodwill vultures. It's not a bad plan. No, it's a good tip. I mean, honestly, you don't even need a store. Go in there and buy them and sell them on Facebook Marketplace or right. something. You'll still get like $10 compared to the dollar that you just spent at Goodwill. Seriously, like, you're not kidding, man. Pro tip, pro tip. Side business, side hustle. Yes. <laughs> you're welcome, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you can be glad that I made this mistake because now exactly. we all have you heard it here first. <laughs> so. Anyway, it happens, right? Stuff happens. It happens. <laughs> yeah. so. All right. That took long enough. Do you want to hear some crime instead of mm-hmm. silly wife business? <laughs> I I mean I liked that too, but yes, that's what okay. the people came for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, so this one is, they're all tough. I know I say this every time, but this one's a tough one. It's real sad. Um, it actually occurred 12 years ago to the day of this episode dropping. So on May oh 10th, goodness. this occurred. Part of the reason why I wanted this to drop, also, it's the day after Mother's Day, and this is a Mother's Day crime, guys. So, Oh, oh no. Yeah, sad. Very sad. Um, and this one was a suggestion, not by a listener, guys. <laughs> Sorry. But they're friends of ours that live in the, in the neighborhood um, named Zach and Lisa. And the victim here was a client of his. And so they told me about this story and they're like, hey, we know you do this podcast. This will probably be like a story that would interest you. So this that's why, how I found it. Wow. Are they going to listen to this episode? I hope so. I'm going to tell yeah, them to. Exactly. Like, like, and you can be like- any other. You need to learn what happened to Emery's pants, so tune in. <laughs> I bet you they don't know that story. Maybe they do. I probably told it. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay. So, like I said, 12 years ago to the day that this episode released, it happened on May 10th, 2009. Um, let's start a little bit further back from that, though. Stacy Keene was born October 27th, 1967 in Natick, Massachusetts. Um, I think it's like a little suburb, like west of Boston. I don't know how far west, but it seems like it's just a little bit west of it. Stacy is described by her family as a super happy person, always had a hug for someone, and everyone was her best friend. Seems like a lovely person. She grew up in Natick and attended and graduated from Natick High School in 1985 and then went on to North Adams State University and graduated from there in 1989. She then attended Framingham State College School of Nursing. Okay. And I believe it was while she was there that she met Ed Burns in 1991. He was a merchant marine, which, do you know what that is? I I don't think I do. I know. I, I know I've heard the term. Anyways, so for those of you who are with us in this boat, they transport cargo and passengers during times of peace and during times of war. They are an ex- auxiliary to the Navy and will deliver like military personnel to where they need to go or materials as needed. So, okay. Yeah, part of the military, but they kind of have two different things going on here. Needless to say, he would be out to sea for months at a time, like six months stints. So, Ed would be described by Stacy's family as a little bit eccentric, maybe a bit unusual or different, and they had a whirlwind relationship, and within a year, they're married. So meet in 1991, 92, they're married, and he's like gone a lot of the times. So, mm-hmm. And she's a Scorpio. Oh, yes. I was going to say that I, right there. Totally did, it didn't even hit me. It's like day yeah. before you, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, not same year, though. <laughs> no, but we have you. similar birthdays. <laughs> yes. So it's mentioned in some articles that they're Catholic. So I would assume that they had a Catholic service, but I also think it's mentioned because they also, by their 10th anniversary, had five kids. One son, Michael, who's the oldest, and four girls, Shannon, Kelly, and twins, Madison and Morgan. So they also moved several times during this time. Initially, they moved from Natick to Millis, which wasn't a far move. It's like, you know, another town away or whatever in Massachusetts. And then they moved to Wolfboro, New Hampshire, which is probably about two, two to two and a half hours away from Millis. 
and Matic. Natic. Wolfboro is a small lake town, which is has about 6,000 residents, but apparently it can go up to about 25,000 in the summers because it attracts vacationers. Okay, tourist town. Yeah, touristy town. It was also somewhat of a dream spot to live for Stacy. <clears throat> in Wolfboro, Stacy gets a job as a nurse at Carpenter Elementary School. And as you can imagine, with Ed being gone sometimes six months at a time, it had to be hard on Stacy to manage all of the kids and a job on her own. They did have a live-in babysitter, Brittany, which I'm sure helped out a lot and was much needed. The doors to her home were always open to everyone, no matter the age. So her friends, her children, friends, everybody was just always around. They were like the house to be at. That's <clears> fun. <throat> yeah, it is fun. I like, I, I, I kind of like to be that house too. So same. When Ed would come back from his stints at sea, things would be a bit stressful because there would be kind of an adjustment period that would have to happen every single time. Everyone would have to go through it. Dad's home. Their routines would be out of whack. And Stacy and Ed didn't always see eye to eye on how to handle things around the house with the kids. But for that long period of time, Stacy was the only one that had to handle it. So it was kind of like, no, why? we're just going to keep on going this way. Sorry you disagree with it, but we need to keep going. Which... Totally understandable. Everyone's oh, absolutely. In that yeah. yeah. Brittany, the babysitter, would even notice a little bit of tension in the house when he would return. And she even mentioned that Ed may have had a little bit of a slight jealousy streak because he would constantly want to know where Stacy was, what she was doing, all that kind of fun stuff. <clears throat> Which, you know, all of this is hard on both sides. So he's gone. So he feels disconnected from their everyday life. And I'm sure Stacy's used to the freedom. And now all of a sudden her she has this partner to quote unquote answer to in some ways, but you know, they want to just stick with the path they're going down. So things don't really get any easier as time goes on. And as a matter of fact, as Stacy will state in court documents, Ed is mentally and physically abusive and it has gotten worse over the years as he starts to drink a little bit more. Yikes. Well, yeah. So after 17 years of marriage, Stacy files for a restraining order against Ed in July of 2007. And at this time, she's awarded full custody of the kids. And she officially files for divorce in September of 2007, while Ed is on one of his stints at sea. So he's not even there. <clears throat> in the court documents about the restraining order, Stacy alleges that Ed has threatened to cut off parts of her body, demand sex at times, and has bonfires and burned her clothes and cosmetics and will make derogatory remarks in front of other people about her. Oh, right. That is a lot of stuff. That's it is a lot of well stuff. beyond just a jealous Marine. Mm -hmm. And also understandable why she gets full custody when she does this restraining order. Exactly. Oh my goodness. So he's even he has even said to her and others that death. There's it will be death before divorce. Mm. So a little, little scary there. <clears throat> so as we know and can imagine, honestly, because we don't know this, um, divorce can take a while to reach a conclusion. And it has been stated by Ed that Stacy continued to see him and he would spend time with the family at outings and such throughout the years, despite this restraining order. Which I mean, when you have five kids. And at this point, they range from 7 to 15 years old. You're trying to be a good parent and not take them away from their dad. And I would imagine if everything was always aimed at her and never the kids, she probably was like, well, he's a good dad. But I don't know. think I would be like that, though. I mean, I know it's hard to say when you're in that situation what you would be like. But if I'm scared of somebody. Right. Agreed. I 100% agree with you, but I'm just saying, like, I could imagine how hard that is to manage and, you know, not want to take your kids away from their dad and whatnot. Cause I can imagine what it was like for the kids. So, yeah. Oh, gosh. And they probably blamed her too. Yeah. You know I, what I, I mean? don't know kids, that, but yeah, possible. Kids don't know. They don't understand. Oh, yeah. It's terrible. So, and maybe at the very least, that restraining order was kind of a layer of protection for her. Like, it helped her keep control of the contact she had with him and then like wouldn't have to if she didn't feel safe or something. So who knows? 
Stacy, nope, sorry. In March of 2009, the couple had finally reached the point of distributing property in their divorce. And details of that I couldn't find. So I don't know what that was. It was just stated that's where they were at at that point. But however, sometime in March, there's a dispute over money, which violates whatever these terms were that I couldn't find, the court order made in that in the divorce. So it's actually considered a contempt of court, and they have to schedule an appearance before a judge. And that is scheduled for May 11th of 2009. Okay. Which would be the day after Mother's Day on that yeah. particular year. Okay. So when we get back from this break, we will get into the rest of their story. Oh, man. Okay. So Stacy had started to move on with her life a bit at this point. And it was such a small town that it was kind of a hard to find someone to date that you don't already know everything about or whatever. They don't know everything about you. What They know what's going on in your life, yada, yada. So she had this friend named Jim Vidham. Jim was a logger and a divorced father of two. Jim's son and Stacy's son, Michael, were on the same hockey team. So Stacy and Jim spent a lot of time together chatting at games and whatnot. Oh, gosh. It eventually evolved into more than that. And after about three months, Jim was head over heels in love with her. And he will say that he believes she was as well. However, friends of Stacy will say that that's not she was not exactly ready for like the Brady Bunch type of ending yet. So she was kind of like, yeah, this is like, you know, friends with benefits kind of thing, you know, like casual, more casual. Okay. Her marriage had ultimately just ended. So clearly, you know, you're not ready for that. And she just wanted to have some time on her own. And having that companion was just fine for her. So I think Jim was a little bit more serious than she wanted. So she ended it with Jim. Oh, okay. But they're still seeing each other. They're still friends. They, you know, their kids are friends. I believe their sons were friends and they had daughters that were friends too. So, you know, whatever. You're amicable. Friends, whatever. On Sunday, May 10th, 2009, which was Mother's Day, as I mentioned earlier, Stacy's two oldest children and a few friends of theirs had spent the night and they woke up and Stacy wasn't down from bed. So it was a little strange for them to not see her up and about, but they were like, ah, it's Mother's Day. Let's give her some time in bed, leave her alone. But after a bit, Michael, the oldest son who was 15, went up to check on his mom. And when he walked into the bedroom, he just found her lifeless body on her bed, surrounded in a pool of blood. Mm. 911 was called immediately, and it was determined that Stacy had died of multiple stab wounds. Oh, goodness. Whoever could have done this on Mother's Day, just have her ch own children find her, like, monster. I mean, on Mother's like, Day. On Mother's Day, yes. Like, Ugh. So, now, remember, this is a super quiet, safe little town, the kind of town where nobody locks their doors. So, police suspect that an intruder entered the house in the early mornings of the hours and murdered, in the early morning hours, and murdered Stacy. And the, her house was full of kids, her kids, yep, other there was friends. Whoa, that's crazy. Okay. Only the two oldest kids and then four, I'll explain all this later, but only the two oldest kids and four of their friends. So there were six teenagers essentially in the house. Okay. They set up a perimeter near the house and start questioning everyone, including all of these um, teenagers. And none of them heard a thing that night. And they were literally like steps away. I mean, this is a multi-level house. I think it was like a colonial house, but it, I mean, you're still fairly close within the same quarter. So no, nobody heard anything. So let's talk a little bit about the days leading up to this horrible murder. On Friday, May 8th, Stacy met up with Ed to hand off their three youngest children to visit him for the weekend. So... That night, Stacy has dinner with a local man, which by the way, Ed, I think I mentioned this later, so I'm going to have to remember I've already mentioned it, but um, he's moved and I think he's moved back to Millis at this point, which okay. is back in Massachusetts. So he's a couple hours away. So they meet up so the three youngest can have time with him for the weekend. Okay. So he's so towns away, hours yeah, away. Yeah, hours away. Okay. Another state away. I mean, <laughs> essentially. So... That night, Stacy has dinner with another local man, not Jim, and his name is never mentioned, which I totally understand. He probably doesn't want to get mixed up in this scandal. But it's said that Jim was outside Stacy's house and saw them together through the window, 
and confronted her about this situation because he wanted her to know that he felt like she should not be seeing anyone else. Like, you're not ready for it. Why are you ready for it with this guy? But anyway, but she was out to dinner. She wasn't like getting married to this guy. And he the- confronted them at dinner. Like he barged on at in their and was house. like, just so you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know you. how it exactly it happened. If it was like when he was leaving or like knocked on the door, I don't know that those specific details, but it, there was a confrontation about the fact that she was out to, on a date with this guy. So friends have said that this upset Stacy. And she was like, I'm going to go have a talk with Jim tomorrow because I need him to know that this is really over and this behavior is not okay. Mm -hmm. That's a a real boundary cross right there. Yeah, exactly. So she does that, just that. And these same friends have also said that when she came back, she was happy with how the conversation went and that she was glad that she went and did it. And so that things were just fine with Jim. Stacy's two oldest children were having, as I mentioned, had friends over that Saturday night. And Jim showed up at that point. So they had had this conversation sometime during this day. Jim shows up that evening again to at their house and says, and he says he left around 11 or 1130 that night. And that's confirmed by the kids. They said Jim did go. There was also a plan to take Jim and Stacy had a plan to take their two daughters the next morning on Mother's Day to a lacrosse tournament. So obviously Stacy doesn't show up, you know, because We know that the kids found her the next morning and Jim gets worried. So he goes over to the house after a while and checks on them. And as soon as he gets there, he sees the police. And when he walks up to the house, Stacy's daughter just kind of says, well, mom's dead, you know, and he is in shock. A week later, they have a viewing and a funeral. I'm just kind of mentioning this because I didn't know where else to put it, but they, and she goes back to her hometown of Natick and they bury her there. 700 people show up for her funeral. Oh so, my gosh, wow. Kind of the whole town. Well, yeah, she is loved. No one could believe that this could happen in that tiny town or to Stacy. You know, if it's going to happen to anybody, why is, how could it be Stacy? Mm-hmm. So Jim at this point immediately starts talking to police that morning when he's there, when he shows up and sees the police. And he says to them, I'm quoting this, but I don't know if it's verbatim, but. You have to get, you have to look at me. You've got to clear me because I'm going to be his reasonable doubt. Eddie killed her. So he's immediately pointing at the finger at Eddie, which I'm sure we all went there considering the restraining oh, yeah. order and mm-hmm. like all the other stuff that he has said to have done. Yeah, I definitely thought he was going to be the bad guy. Right. And apparently Jim had also heard the death before divorce. Like Eddie had said this more than one time to mo- to her, to other people. So He's heard it from his mouth, so logical thinking for him to think Ed did this. But get this. He also offers up the information that his blood will probably be under Stacy's nails because he had asked her to help him take a splinter out that night that he showed up because he's a logger, so I'm sure he had a big, big splinter. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Somewhere. I don't know. Where <laughs> but well, that's I mean, weird. That is suspect, Jim. Right. And he actually turns out to be correct. His blood was found under her nails. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know what also- else gets blood under your fingernails trying to defend yourself against somebody who's stabbing you? Mm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Hmm. A little suspicious. He also has cuts on his legs and his face, which he says were caused by branches. Because remember, again, a logger. So all of these things that he's saying, I mean, could very well be explained by what he's saying, like, uh, you know, splinter from work, cut by branches from work, but also could be explained by you were the murderer. Just just putting it out there. Uh-huh. It's all suspicious. Uh-huh. Um, so they spend a good amount of time questioning. I want to say, I didn't write it down, but I want to say it was like 14 hours that first day of questioning Jim. Hmm. His ex-wife, Jim's ex-wife, states that he was at her house chaperoning a sleepover at their house that night. But I find that kind of weird too, because if you remember, he was at Stacy's house until like eleven or eleven thirty. So if he's chaperoning, you don't even show up to chaperone another sleepover until that like that late. I mean, I feel like there was a lot of time there that these kids were then, you know. Not Where was she? Years. Where was well, I don't know. Wife? That How I don't know. He? Okay. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe it's some agreement that they were supposed to be chaperoning, but if. 
again, that that's also, I don't know if she was there, but I'm guessing if he was planned to be there, that she wasn't going to be there. And so there was a reason why he had to chaperone. But how would she know he was there the whole time then? Or that he was there really at all during the times that of this yeah. murder? I mean, no. I guess the kids would have to tell. Yeah, I guess. So anyway, whatever. Police give him a polygraph, which apparently he fails. So there's Jim for you. That's what I got on Jim. Wow. Okay. Lots on Jim. So clearly they're going to look into Ed as well because he's the husband or, or soon to be ex-husband. That mm-hmm. is, you know, not, it's not a good divorce. It's not an easy one. He says that he's at a party in Boston that night, which remember he moved back. So he's close to Boston. Because mm-hmm. initially when I'm like reading all these, I'm like all confused by the timeline. I was like, he drove two and a half hours to go to a party in Boston. But no, he had a, apparently at this time been moved back into Massachusetts. So he's probably like maybe at most 30 minutes out of Boston. Right. So he also has a friend that provides video from that party to verify that he was there. Okay. And he had the three youngest children as well. Right. Which is also what I'm thinking. Like I, you have th- your three youngest kids who you probably don't see, I'm guessing, on a regular basis if you're that far away. So he goes out to a party in Boston but, you know, whatever. I mean, people do it. Probably got a babysitter. Maybe guess, they were what? with him. Maybe it was like our parties, you know, that we have in yeah. our house. I, and yeah. Everyone brings the kids and they watch movies or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's possible. It's possible. So I will say that I believe at this point, like I said, he had moved back. So it's close and it's clear possibility that all of this happened and it was, you know, fine. And he's two and a half hours away. So it is stated by some people that he could drive there. And drive back and still be at the party, but I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Possible, clearly possible. I mean, we, he's known to be abusive, right? It's documented exactly. that he is abusive physically towards her. So the fact that he would hurt her is not crazy. Yeah, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, well, we're gonna have to side eye you. Mm-hmm. Exactly, I'm side eyeing both Jim. Mm-hmm. And no. So they questioned somewhere around 50 people during their investigation. Um, Many details, I mean, a lot of details have not been released about this case at all because they just keep saying it's an ongoing investigation and they don't want to chance ruining that. So literally there was the same stuff written every single, like from like articles from 2009 until 2020, it's like the same things over and over again because they, they won't release anything. So no one has ever been arrested. Wow. Oh, my gosh. You're kidding. Nope. No one. And like I said, they keep calling it an active investigation. And um, in one article, somebody said that uh, one of the detectives like clarified it's active, which means we are continuously getting new leads to work on. So in these 12 years, according to them, they're getting new things to keep working on. And it's not cold. It's not a cold case. Hmm. So immediately following the murder, Ed moved back into the home with the kids and he's given custody. I mean, clearly that's, I guess, the logical way to go. They only live there for about a year before they lose the house due to foreclosure. And in a more recent article I found with some very little info, but Michael, the oldest, is still living in Wolfboro because at this point he's, you know, an adult over 18. Um, And his sisters are living in... Massachusetts with other family members. So at some point, these kids t- make a break from Michael or are forced to make a break from, not Michael, um, Ed. Right, Dad. Dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, again, I don't know why. I cannot find any information on well, when. It might have to do with his job. Well, Maybe yes. He's gone for six months at a time. He can't take care of kids. That is entirely possible. So um, in 2011, 2020 aired an episode about this case just to kind of keep it in the spotlight and try and get some new stuff going. Stacy's family has kind of been reluctant to participate in anything to do with this case, you know, in the media besides like news articles or whatever, because they don't want to sensationalize it, they say. So they weren't going to participate in 2020. I think it was like 2020 or Dateline. One of the two would do it, not both. And 2020 was picked. But they weren't going to participate. But Stacy's friends and Ed were participating. So they were like, well, I feel like we kind of have to have some sort of representation here because I don't want it to just be this one-sided 
thing. So her brother agrees to take part in it. And I cannot find it anywhere. There's 10 minutes, which is the beginning of it online that I watched, but I can't find it anywhere, even to pay for it. Like hmm. I can't, it's, it's gone. <laughs> I don't know where it is. Interesting. It's very weird. In 2012, a duffel bag was discovered in the yard of a neighbor's house. And it was found while this neighbor was repairing a stone wall in his backyard and it appeared to have been there for a long time. It wasn't buried. It was just sitting there. So he called police to like have it taken away and they took it to just test things to see if it's there's any connection in this case. But that's like three years for this duffel bag to just kind of be sitting there not buried. Mm-hmm. You know? So anyway, nothing was ever come had come of it. But that was like the most recent thing that I could find on this case. Any also neighbors have said that the house has sat vacant on the and on the market for a really long time and it had been dubbed the murder house, so no one would buy it and it just depreciated in value over time. But from what I can see, somebody bought it in 2013 and I think has kind of turned it around. But I I don't know. I wouldn't blame people for not wanting to. I mean, a small town like that, that it's gonna be known. It's not just like, you know, in Chicago and it's one of like however many houses that a murder has happened in, you know. Yeah. It's, Probably the only murder that has happened in this town. My oh, guess. my gosh. Okay. Hopefully. Yeah. So here's the last interesting tidbit. Since I don't really have like – there's no resolution to this case. So I can't – I'm not going to give you one. But another interesting tidbit that has recently happened was in July of 2018. Ed was arrested in his home in Millis, Massachusetts for allegedly stabbing another man during an argument. Witnesses say they heard him say he was going to stab this guy, and then the next thing they hear was yells from the man saying, Ed did stab me, get me help, essentially. So this man did survive the attack, so he's all right. And he was Ed was arraigned in 2019, and he pled not guilty, but I have not been able to find anything or any update on this case if he went to trial or if anything happened. So anyway, clearly Ed has the capability of stabbing someone which is an interesting fact. This is wild. It is wild. I have and so many questions. I'm sure you did too when you were researching and they probably have the answers to some of these questions and are not releasing it. Like, was there a murder weapon? Did the kids see her after Jim left at 11 o'clock that night or did something happen while he was there? Right. I yes. have questions and they probably know these things. I'm sure they do. And everything, like literally, they're just like, we're not releasing it because of the integrity of the investigation, blah, blah, blah. Because I'm sure being this small town that there are specific things that, you know, like if they released, it would be like, well, we will never catch them because we know this and whatever. Like if they can finally connect somebody to some random little piece of evidence that they have, then it's that's the way they're going to get it. And there's like I, three... The evidence of Jim's DNA being under her fingernails is a lot. That's a lot of evidence, though, right? I, know. I mean, I know. I'm sure and he, he does have the reasons polygraph. that he feels could explain it away. I'm sure he does. Right. But yeah. so would any other murderer. Those reasons aren't going to add up based on, I think that's a lot. I know. I think it's a lot too, but I feel like they, they must have something more that's making them be like, oh, he must have had an him. alibi. That's the only thing I can think of that they saw her after he left and she was alive. And then the kids confirmed that he came home and stayed home. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but it's not stated anywhere. So who, who the heck knows? But there are three scenarios. One, that Jim did it. <laughs> Two, that Ed did it but not on his own. He either came back from Boston, like I said earlier, and then went back or he hired someone to do it, which Mm. I mean, I guess again, it's possible or it's just some, a complete random act that happened. You know, she had our doors unlocked and some random person came in, which I find that's like the least plausible thing. I agree because there would have to be like rape yeah, evidence right. or robbery or the kids would have been hurt in some way. Like they wouldn't just come in and pick this one random person alone. Right. And they yeah. knew there were children in the home probably. So they would have killed them too. That's exactly. creepy. Oh my gosh. I can't imagine being one of those teenagers and knowing that you were in the house when this happened and how, like what an awful feeling for them. Yeah. And to be 12 years and have no answers. 
I know, I know. And you know this poor town was terrified, thinking that there was some crazy stabber killer running around that could just sneak in like the Night Stalker. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's what was one of the articles somebody, like a neighbor was interviewed or something, and they were saying, like I mentioned, like nobody locked their doors. Well, it now became this place where like, well, we got to lock our doors. We got to keep our safe. So super, super sad. I hope they get some resolution. I'm totally keeping my eye on this because clearly like little bits like come up every now and then on it. And I mean, just, I'm going to keep my eye on it. Good case. Yeah. I might actually set up a Google alert on my (laughs) my Google so that if her name pops up on anything, I just like sends me an email because I need to, I need to keep on that. Sad, sad. Yes. Wow. Happy Mother's Day. I know guys. Sorry. That's terrible. That's terrible. Yeah. I wish I knew to uh, kind of an update. The only update I saw was when Michael said that he was living in Wolfboro and he said that he went to college but dropped out and but he was hoping to start again. Um, and he stays there just because he loves the town. He knew his mom loved it, but he understands why his siblings aren't there. Um, but I don't really have any update on any of the kids. I mean, they're little, so they constantly have fundraisers though. Like there's runs, there's golf outings to like raise money for them because there's five of them and they they need to go through college. They need to like get through life. So, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, thanks for that story. That's absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. Also, I was thinking something funny at one point when you were telling the story about holding on to your pants, and then it made me laugh because Emery has no pants. <laughs> <laughs> So you should get him that shirt from our website that says hold on to your pants because that's a real double meaning for him. Well, maybe a nice Father's Day gift. <laughs> <laughs> hold on to them if you got them. That's yeah, what we got them. Or hold on to what you have now because you never know I might get rid of all these. <laughs> it would be a funny shirt though. <laughs> I wonder if he would get it. <laughs> oh, for sure. I think he would. <laughs> that's great okay well thanks for listening guys again if you're a mama out there or a pseudo mom or a god mom or whatever happy mother's day to you don't get stabbed please no Mm-mm. don't get stabbed that's really sad um i'm really interested to see this family's pictures and just put faces to names and learn a little bit more about them so check out our social media if you guys are interested in that too check out our merch get you a shirt hold on to your pants (laughs) it means more now (laughs) yeah right (laughs) and we hope you keep listening if you're new here thanks for joining us we hope you come back Um, Hit subscribe, tell your friends about us, let us know how you like us, reach out, send suggestions, and give us some love. And always remember, the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet.